Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by the time the boat, battered by the waves, was far out from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, create in us a clean heart this day and put a right spirit in us, now and always. Amen. Today marks the sixth and final sermon in our series, The Miracles You Thought You Knew. Since February the 5th, we have been looking at the miraculous things about Jesus and how those miracles affect our lives today. We have seen him turn water into wine, restored the sight to Bartimaeus, healed a woman with blood disorders, cured a paralyzed man, and we watched as he was transfigured on the mountain. Today we have Jesus walking on water. This miracle is not a healing miracle, it is one where Jesus produced a miraculous feat. Okay, my note spells feet, F-E-E-T, and I'm going to let that slide that you didn't laugh because of the clock thing, but that was supposed to be funny. That's better. I like that. But that's your funny bit for the day, so I, I wanted to get it in because that's all you get. This story takes place right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, and for whatever reason, he sends the disciples in the boat ahead of him, and he goes up the mountain to spend some time with God in prayer. The disciples are battling a storm. The actual words are, by this time the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. Jesus must have seen that there was a bit of rough seas, and so he comes across the water to help them. We know that they were all scared because Jesus says, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. This is a great little passage because in these verses we see that Jesus went to help his disciples. Jesus had a great bonding moment with Peter, and when he and Peter got into the boat, the winds and the storm immediately ceased. And to the disciples, there was no doubt that this was the Son of God. Now, if you could relive one day with Jesus, wouldn't this day be at the top of your list? Think about what's going on. So imagine that you are one of Jesus' disciples. You are with him on a warm spring day. Thousands of people have gathered to hear what he has to say. The crowd is captivated. They spend hours hours listening to him, mesmerized by who he was and what he had to say. You notice that the crowd is so captivated, they spend all day with him and they miss a meal and now it is time to eat. You watch as Jesus sits them all down on the grass and he takes a boy's lunch and he turns it into a feast that feeds over five and scholars today say it was probably closer to nine or 10,000 because when this was originally written, they probably wouldn't have counted women and children and another thing. So he's feeding nine, 10,000 people. 
And as the day winds down, Jesus needs some downtime. So he sends you and the disciples on ahead, and he goes up in the mountain to be with God. Meanwhile, the disciples are in a boat, and out of Norway, nowhere a huge storm surges upon the water. The boat you are in is being tossed like a rag doll. And just when everyone is so filled with fear that terror sinks in, Jesus is seen coming towards you. Not, not in a boat, not, not swimming. He, he doesn't even magically appear. You witness him walking on top of the sea. When he gets in the boat, everything stops. The, the, the wind, the storm, everything dies right down. For you in that moment, there is no doubt this is God's son. There is no doubt he is here to help. There is no doubt that that experience would change your life forever. If, if you could live, if I could relive a day with Jesus, that one would be at the top of my list. And and since we can't go back in time, this event of mine is, is just a daydream. It's, it's an opportunity for me to pretend for a while. And I use the word pretend because in reality, we do have God's Son with us, helping us and forever changing our lives. When we are being battered, by the storms of our career, the storms of our family, the storms of illness, the storms of grief, the storms of our sins, our failures, and our mistakes. Jesus comes to help. He is, he is our anchor during the tempest. He calms the raging storms that we face. He does not make the storms disappear. He will not prevent the storms from taking place. And it may seem that sometimes we are in that boat without him and he is up on a mountain far away. But make no mistake, Christ is right by our side, providing a calmness and a peace that allows the storms in our lives to pass. It's also important that we look at this interaction between Peter and Jesus. Beginning at verse 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. And Peter get, got out of the boat and started walking on the water towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cries out to be saved. Jesus saves him and says, ye of little faith, why do you doubt? I think we are a lot like Peter in many ways. We live our lives for God. With Jesus as part of our lives, we get excited. We want to run to him. We want to be by his side. Our faith is strong at first. But then we start to think. We analyze. We become afraid. This happens because even though Jesus is by our side and our faith is strong, we quickly rely on our own strength. And as soon as we do that, we begin to sink. And when we are facing trouble, when we are in the deep end and struggling to even tread water, we, like Peter, yell out for Jesus to rescue us. And Jesus comes to our side and saves us. But think of all that we could do in this world and think of all that we could have done if we relied on Jesus in the first place. Do you know what Peter's problem was, what our problem is? Peter looked at Jesus and began to walk towards him. Everything was fine until he noticed the wind and the things that were going on around him. As long as he was looking at Christ, he was safe. But when he was distracted, when he lost his focus, when his focus was on something other than Jesus, he began to sink. So then the million dollar question for this morning is how do we keep our focus on Christ? There was a man who went to a restaurant. He had a date at eight o'clock in the evening. So he gets to this restaurant about quarter till, 7.45 or so. And he goes into the restaurant and he picks the table he wants to sit at because he comes to this place often. 
And so he picks up a table that's, that's not in the front, it's kind of in the back, but it can see everything going around, and he can watch the door for when his date arrives. He takes off his outer coat, he sits down at the table, very well presented man, very average, average height, average looking. He's wearing a nice uh, blue suit and a, a catchy tie. I didn't know what word to use there. A catchy tie to match. A dabonair, a natty dress. I don't know what you want, but he looks good. That's, what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to get across. Uh, the, the waiter comes over with a cup of coffee in his hand because this man comes in here all the time and he knows what to get him. And the waiter puts the coffee down and he says, are you ready, sir? And he goes, no, I have a date tonight with my friend Cassie. I'll wait for her to come. And the waiter leaves. The man starts, you know, stirring the coffee, playing, playing with his cup, thinking about uh, what's about to happen. He is very excited with his friend Cassie coming to meet him. It seems as if they've been friends forever and that they've been a part of each other's lives at least as long as he can remember. He likes talking to her. He likes what she's become, what she's done with her life, how, how, how good of a person that she is. But what he's really looking forward to tonight is the opportunity just to hear about her day. He, he, loves, the, he loves the sparkle in her eyes when she talks about the routines and the good things that happened that day. And he loves the passion in her voice and in her body language when she talks about problems she solved that day or people she helped that day. So he is very excited about her coming. And the waiter comes over again and talks up his coffee and asks him if he wants to order. And he says, no, I'll wait. And the waiter goes away. And the waiter goes away and he finds another waiter and he says, I don't know whether to feel sorry for this guy or whether to call him an idiot. This is the third time in five weeks he's been at this restaurant. She's not coming. She didn't come the first time. She didn't come the second time. She didn't come the last time. And she's not coming tonight. And, and, and I just feel so sorry for this man because she's not coming. And the other waiter says, well, what do you care? What does it matter? Just serve the man as meal and leave him alone. And the waiter says, well, I do care because I do feel sorry for him. But he says, I don't care who you are and what the circumstances are. The worst thing in the world is being stood up for anything. And so I do care. And the man is still waiting and enjoying his coffee and, and keeps getting his refills. And time passes and time passes. And the waiter comes by, and he's been here a while now. And he says, sir, do you want to order now? And he says, no, I'll wait. And the waiter says, you know, sir, I, I don't mean to be rude, and I'll probably get in trouble for this, but why? Why do you wait? She's not coming. She hasn't come before. Why do you think she's going to show up tonight? And the man says, well, she's important to me, and she needs me, and she'll come. So the waiter goes away, tops up his coffee one more time, and it's now 10.30, quarter to 11. He's been there almost three hours for his 8 o'clock appointment. He's still alone. He asks for the check. He goes and pays for the river of coffee that he drank, waiting for her to come. And he walks outside of the restaurant with this. When he gets outside the restaurant, it's a very cold night. Let's just say it's Ohio, if that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, then we all know what the weather is. So it's a very cold night. And he, he buttons up his coat, you know, fixes his scarf, all what you do before you walk out into the wind and the cold. And as he's doing this, you can see the disappointment in his face. You can see the sadness in his eyes. You can see the, the, the worry lines that are developing. And as he walks out into the cold, he just says, why don't you come? Why didn't you come tonight? And he walks off you know, into the moonlight, whatever it is, he's, he's, he's away. About the time he's outside doing the things with his coat and thinking, about that time, Cassie's getting home from a night where she had been out with her friends. And she had been out having a good time with her friends. She, she needed tonight, it was girls' night. They went to dinner, they went dancing, and, and they had the most wonderful time. Cassie is so 
tired, so drained from her evening, so affected by the wonderful time she had, that uh, she doesn't even take the makeup off. She doesn't even brush her teeth. She just puts on her jammies and falls into bed. And as she rolls over to turn out the light, she sees a note on her bedside table. And it says, Friday night, 8 o'clock, don't forget to spend time with Jesus in prayer. You, you, you knew that was coming. No, you didn't. like you knew. And she said, oh, I forgot. I forgot to show up and do that. I need it tonight. I need it to be with my friends. I'll do it another time. God will understand. How do we keep our focus on Christ? We don't stand him up. We don't ignore him. We don't only expect him to show up when we cry out because we are sinking. How do we keep our focus on Christ? By running to him, by focusing on him, and by never taking our eyes off of him. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this and each day. Help us to do our best for you and our best in this world, now and always. Amen.